Thank you everyone that is joining us physically today and everyone joining us virtually from home or your home office. So we have a fun topic today. We're going to be talking about how to manage your fund in this ever-changing uh, VC industry. Uh, I would like to give the opportunity to our audience uh, to raise hands and ask questions and interact with us and my dear panelists as well. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions to each other and, uh, as we said, expose yourselves. Uh, let's briefly introduce ourselves uh, but first to know a bit the audience here can you guys raise hands who is investor here it's how many investors do we have all right fantastic uh, startups all right business angels do we have any business angels here fantastic good <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to just interact with us. But let's briefly introduce ourselves. Uh, I can introduce uh, briefly myself. My name is Virginia. Uh, I'm representing Startup Norway and I'm also representing the Norwegian startup ecosystem. Happy to be in uh, Copenhagen interacting with our Danish uh, friends. Um, so quickly on Startup Norway, uh, we are a private organization that we have been 10 years now working in developing <coughs> the Norwegian startup ecosystem. We're working very actively making better deal flow coming from Norway. I know Norway has very poor reputation in good deals, but uh, there's more and more exciting things coming up. And we're also working very extensively with the investor ecosystem. So we've been the last five years working very broadly, building a strong business angel network in Norway, uh, a place where there is a lot of private capital that unfortunately is not going into startups. So we want to change that. And more recently, we have also been working with uh, emerging funds, so people raising their first funds, uh, helping them in that in that process. So I'm very passionate about LP fundraising and how to structure uh, your fund. That's briefly me. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, my panelists now. I guess we can start with you, Martin. Uh, and everyone, please introduce yourselves, uh, your fund, and I would love a fun fact about you. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll try to uh, deliver, especially on the fun fact. Yeah, um, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is uh, Martin Eriksson. I'm an investor at Eight Roads Ventures. We're a global venture capital fund. Um, I'm based in, in London myself, which is where we have a European fund. But uh, we have sister funds uh, both in the US as well as many places across Asia. So a global platform, we um, manage a little bit more than $8 billion in uh, venture capital today. Have a little bit more than 300 investments in uh, technology and healthcare. But we focus very much on the scale up phase. So tends to be uh, companies who um, have found often a strong product market fit, often looking for an international scale-up investor to, uh, to lead the next round of, of funding. I've been in, in uh, tech now for about, uh, for about eight years. Uh, five of those have been uh, at Eight Roads. Uh, I'm Swedish, uh, might be able to tell from, from the accent. Uh, so I, um, I lead our, our sourcing and investment efforts in, in the Nordics. And a uh, fun fact about me, I'm, um, I'm known as the muesli man in, in the office. Um, I have uh, uh, a little bit of a, of a weird passion for, for muesli. I've <laughs> uh, been um, having uh, muesli at least twice a day for, for as long as I can remember, both for breakfast and, and uh, as, a, as an afternoon snack. So I've become the, the go-to person for, for anyone looking for a good blend in, in the office. <laughs> That was very well delivered, Martin. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're going to move on to you, Mika. Please introduce yourself. I'm Mika Salmi. I'm the managing partner at Lakestar. Uh, Lakestar, we have offices in Zurich, where I am, London, and Berlin. My background is I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started four companies. I was a entrepreneur mainly in uh, San Francisco, where I had Sequoia Capital, Greylock, some well-known investors invest in my companies. Um, at Lakestar, we are investing currently out of two funds. We have a 250 million euro early stage fund and a 425 million euro growth fund. Uh, and so our total, we don't quite have 8 billion, but I think we have 1.5 billion under management, about 120 companies in our portfolio. Lakestar has been around for about 10 years. It was founded by a gentleman named Klaus Hommels. Um, and my fun fact is my hometown in Finland is where Santa Claus comes from. 
<laughs> Rovaniemi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mikan. And please, Killian, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Killian Pender. Um, I'm a partner at North Zone um, as of today. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just fresh off the boat. Um, so, before joining North Zone, um, I was an entrepreneur myself, um, involved in sort of three different companies. Um, and before that, I was an investor. So, I spent some time with Blackstone and, um, and Centerbridge. Um, North Zone is a mostly a Series A uh, investor. We manage about a billion today uh, of euros capital. Um, we are investing our ninth fund, which is 450 million um, euros. Um, and uh, yeah, getting getting towards the end of that. <laughs> um, and my fun fact is that I am just a partner today. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, panelists. So why I emphasize on fun facts is because the VC industry is a people industry at the end of the day. It's about building relationships and that's why we're all here. So I hope that you guys know us a bit more uh, after this little introduction. But then let's jump into the workshop uh, today. We have a broad topic and I thought uh, maybe it was a um, good idea to anchor it in a bit of the context. What is European, the Europe uh, industry looking now? And what we're seeing is unprecedented competition on the VC side. We haven't seen so many new investors coming in from the very early stage to the later stage, the early stage investors investing later, the later investors earlier, the Americas coming in. So it's really getting very busy. Um, and this is forcing the European funds, of course, to make some uh, important uh, decisions, to make uh, some shifts in the strategy to keep themselves competitive and, and relevant moving forward. And uh, before we just touch on some uh, things that we can do, how we can change our deal flow strategy, how we can maybe think uh, broader into new geographies. I want to ask you guys, uh, I would like to hear your reading on uh, what is going on in the VC industry in Europe. Uh, how is this competition, why are we having this strong competition coming up? And what is it coming next? Martin, do you want to take this question first? Yeah, sure. I have to uh, you know, provide our, our perspectives. Um, these are interesting things that we often you know, debate uh, in, internally as well. I think I mean, we, we definitely see the, you know, the pickup in competition, the pickup in interest in funds. M most of that often stems you know, from, for positive reasons, I think. I mean, we, we're very much of the view that it's, it's never really been a better time to you know, be investing in, in Europe today when you look at you know, favorite metrics uh, such as you know, number of unicorns created or just you know, the quality of, of startups that we're seeing and, and, and the exit outcomes. It's in one way, you know, validation of the opportunity that's there. <laughs> of course, more competition forces us to think and, and, and act differently, but as a whole, we, you know, we, we've never been more busy investing into the ecosystem um, you know, at, at, at the moment and just the, the amount of, of really solid opportunities that we're seeing is, is at unprecedented levels. Very interesting. Kilian, do you want to also compliment? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Think? So I think for me, you know, in deciding what to do um, next, whether to sort of start another company or become an entrepreneur or sort of become a VC, I think, um, as you kind of say, the opportunity now in VC is very unique. Um, I think you sort of have a confluence of factors that make for a very compelling investment environment. So, you know, one of the most important things I think is on the talent side. So. You know, when I was graduating, you know, all the really smart people were doing consulting, banking, law, and now you have lots more of the really talented people who want to go straight into startups. So you have, you know, a lot more sort of great people going into this into the space. Secondly, because there have been, now been so many unicorns, the understanding and the ability to create another one, how do you, how do you acquire customers, how do you hire a team, that knowledge is now sort of in the space. Um, and so inevitably, you're starting to see that, you know, you're starting to see talent, you're starting to see capital, um, and so the, the environment now is much more compelling, and so inevitably, um, that will attract more capital. Like, we had our LP meeting yesterday for North Zone, um, and, you know, just talking to LPs about how the other fund's going, of course. Um, and, um, you know, I think generally for European VC, it's pretty strong, right? They're seeing pretty strong returns. And so in that context, it's not surprising that you see more capital coming. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's probably a good thing, right? I think, th I think there's, there is room for more capital. I think people are like, oh, it's not more competition, but there's more companies. So I think there's, there's actually more to do, I'd say. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Very exciting times. Mika. Um, I'm going to continue with what you're saying there. So you, you brought up a few of the key aspects for entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurs need, uh, entrepreneurship needs ideas, capital, talent, and a market. 
Uh, and for a long time in Europe, you had people with ideas, uh, but they didn't have the capital or the, or the talent pool or even in the market because it was fairly fragmented in what they were doing. So, but, so they would move off into the US. Mm. Uh, the, and it was the same thing uh, from Asia and South America, Africa. San Francisco became this hub. I lived there for 19 years. And I was a first generation immigrant myself there. Uh, and the number of first generation immigrants that started companies that are founders there is 60%. Was, that was the number five years ago, I'm not sure what it is today. But people would move there because that's where you could get the capital, the talents, and then market, the US market. That has changed, that just changed in the last five years. And I think it's, uh, it's fantastic that uh, um, there's some interesting stats so that in Europe, um, there have been just over 200 unicorns in the last decade, uh, and they came from 55 different cities. They didn't come just from Berlin or mm -hmm. Stockholm, or they came from 55 different cities. And so uh, this bodes well for the future of Europe, that there's now, you can have an idea in Sofia, Bulgaria, you can find some local talent because universities are spitting out talent, there's startups that have graduated and people coming out of uh, another mature startup, the talent, and there's capital. There's seed, there's seed investors in every country around Europe, so there's now capital available. There's funds like Lake Star or North Zone that, or Octopus that we invest across Europe. We're looking at all these markets. Um, and I think the European market, even though it's still 27 countries, um, people are creating more and more software products in English, and so there's actually a very transferability of the products, and they become of a global products. A lot of people, when they start in their companies now, they are thinking global immediately, and so they can do a global company from Bulgaria. They don't have to uh, uh, go to the U.S. or go to London, so they can do these global companies very quickly, so the companies are scaling very fast. So all these things are just, they're just really, this whole flywheel has just really started going. So I said to you last night, we're just getting started, I think, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there could be some uh, macroeconomic tailwinds or headwinds or something that comes along that might stop things for a short period, but it's just getting going, and I think the all the little signs of what's happening across Europe uh, are very, very positive. So, founders, you guys are living a unique moment in time with the more capital on, than ever for you, cheaper way of building companies, talent available for you. So, very exciting times. This makes the, the job of being a VC harder. Um, so, uh, now that uh, founders have all these funding options, how do you guys keep yourself uh, relevant and competitive? How each of your funds is positioning themselves uh, towards uh, other existing investors. I'm gonna start again with you, Mika. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, like I said, I was in Silicon Valley for 19 years. I love the competition. <laughs> I really enjoy it. I used to be a competitive athlete too, so I, I, this is like, you know, bring on the competition. It makes everyone better. It makes all the startups better. It makes all the money, but everyone just has to be much, much sharper. I, I think it's, it's good for the ecosystem to have competition. Um, having said that, though, it can you know it's it can also be very tough to be competing against uh, very well known uh, venture firms coming in. For us, what we've done is uh, we've actually in this latest generation of funds we've moved to being uh, having a sector focus. So as opposed to being generalists uh, and opportunists, we've actually focused on certain sectors that we have expertise in and we have a portfolio and we have a team that understands it. So whether it be FinTech or Health Tech or Deep Tech, we actually have people. So when we talk to an a entrepreneur and a founder, we can actually speak their language. We can say, look, we have a portfolio, we have the contacts, we know the corporates, we know the, the funding rounds for the next for the next funding. And so we, we feel that this kind of uh, really uh, speaks better to the market because they, they know what we, what we stand for as, as Lakestar. They know what we, work, what, what, what we can provide for them. And so I think this is a key thing we've done. And we've won many deals over big uh, companies because they came in, a lot of them are U.S. funds, as generalists. And so they didn't really understand uh, what's going on. And also, they aren't on the ground. We are on the ground uh, as Lake Star. So we're in three cities in Europe. We have uh, 16 nationalities on the team. So we speak a lot of different languages. And so we feel we have an advantage in there. But having said that, it's, you know, it still requires you know, uh, really hard work in positioning yourselves um, and hopefully not having to overpay, which is I think in some ways how some people will get a deal is they just overpay. Uh, that's not our mode. We're not uh, Tiger Global. Uh, <laughs> and so we try, we try very hard to uh, be smart about how we invest, uh, but we try to use the tools we have and present ourselves in the best light. Mm. You have touched many topics that I'm going to expand mm -hmm. in a little bit. Mm -hmm. How is the North Zone um, positioning themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things I think about, v so I, 
as I said, I was in private equity and a hedge fund a little bit before. One of the interesting things about VC is, um, if for some of the brand name VCs, is there's a little bit of a, a virtuous circle in that if you sort of back some of the winners, then there's some nice sort of signaling to the market. Um, if you, you know, for, for getting new deals, because people are like, oh, if, well, if you've backed company XYZ, then there's sort of a nice thing. So I think Northstone benefits a little bit from that. I think the business has been going for um, 25 years now. Yeah. Um, so it's been going for quite a while. I think the other thing at Northstone we try and focus on a little is um, pretty much most of our partners have been entrepreneurs themselves. Um, so, um, you know, Jessica, one of the other partners, was, was involved in, in, in HelloFresh. Um, and I think then having something relevant to say to entrepreneurs beyond, here's a bunch of capital, yes. <laughs> um, having had investors like that, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, it's really helpful to be able to say, actually, you know, how you should think about acquiring customers is maybe like this, or how you should hire a team is maybe like this. And, you know, you're obviously not doing that, right? That's not what you, you're doing. That's what the entrepreneur is doing. But having sort of relevant questions is, is, is really helpful. So I think that's probably mm. how Norison does it. Mm. <laughs> so we here have some uh, sector focus approach. We have more like entrepreneurship skills <laughs> approach also to you. <laughs> how are you guys positioning yourselves? Yeah, no. Um, look, I would say for, for us, the, there's a lot of commonality in the, in the points raised by, by Mika and, and Kilian. I, I would say, you know, we, we definitely see competition increasing, especially for you know, the back in the best founders and the best companies out there, there's definitely, you know, a war on, 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 on the best opportunities. For us, that often means, you know, I'd say um, building a relationship earlier with founders is, is crucial for us and, and really trying to, you know, communicate to them the, the value that, that we can bring. We very much try to be, you know, we want to be the scale up uh, investor of, uh, of choice. So a lot of the value that we bring, we try to really lay down on, on, on the scale up path, helping, um, you know, companies in, in, in Europe grow from, you know, 50 employees to, to 1,000 employees and above. So we try to build all, 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 of, all of the expertise around that, be that, you know, venture partners who help on, on go to market or, or us helping kind of leverage our, our global uh, presence in, in Asia or, or, or the US um, for that scaling. But, um, but really getting to, to founders earlier, um, I think one thing that we often you know, look at is, is what value are we bringing? Um, we've been, we've been me measuring our MPS score for, for the last couple of years as, as a way to kind of ascertain that. And, and on the last count earlier this year, we, we got a score of 89 from, from our portfolio companies, which, which is a metric we're, we're quite proud of. And, you know, through that way, I think we're, we're bringing something to the, to the table. Hmm. So, I mean, of course, uh, first of all, is position yourself and bring out what is the value add, how are you guys going to help entrepreneurs? But then something else is to actually win the deal. And I was talking yesterday with Martin, is what keeps you awake at night? And uh, you were quite uh, explicit about that. So you have some uh, insights on how you actually enter uh, into the best deals. Yeah, it, look, it's, it is tough. It's, it's one of... You know, there's a lot of positives with, with the increase in competition, the increase in capital. Is, as we discussed earlier, it's, it's kind of a validation of, of the opportunity in, in, in the tech sector here in, here in Europe. But obviously, you know, getting to, um, to the best opportunities, the, the, the very best founders, it gets in increasingly uh, difficult, I think, again, as, as kind of the strategy for you know, how, how we, uh, you know, evolve as, as funds be becomes really that a demonstration of the value that you can bring. Capital is very much a commodity. The best companies can raise from multiple pockets of, of funds. If it's not VCs, it, you know, it can be private equity funds, hedge funds entering, sovereign wealth funds. There, there, there's a wealth of capital. So I think really the ability to, to demonstrate that value that you can bring and, and, and the early relationship building is, is very key for us. Hmm. Me looking at, at the Nordics, you know, part of that being here today and, and, and you know, trying to be in, in, in the region as often as I can to, to build those close relationship and uh, with founders and, and the ecosystem. Hmm. So in our uh, competence programs for emerging managers, we of course educate them in the process of deal for strategy and positioning themselves. And we broadly talk about two types of investors, the hunters and the farmers. So the hunters that are have a clear target, they're just going to chase the companies that they want to work with and do whatever. And then the farmers is more a bit of what you just have described, you know, just uh, mentoring, giving back, spending time with them, investing long term in them and hopefully uh, season returns coming back. I would say you are a farmer. Um, what about you guys? Are you hunters or are you farmers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
what I, what I feel like we're good at is uh, tracking companies over a long period of time and deciding when we want to invest and how much we want to invest. And so I guess we're farming, but then, <laughs> but then, we, then we give it a lot of uh, fertilizer at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> and the animal comes, we kill the animal. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> because we, we actually, we, we do we kind of, work, okay, let's watch, watch, watch. And then we know, like, look at the data here. Look at that market. We have to have this, you know, this is the top company. Let's go for it. And then we hunt hard. And so, but I think, I don't know that, what that, which, how it works with your analogy. No, no it's true. It's a simplification. There's many more areas, gray areas um, than that. Yeah. Yeah. I think at North Star, it's, a, it's, a, it's again, I think it's some combination. I think there is, I think, I think about my relationship with the business, you know, I knew the partners for a long time uh, and even and before they were thinking about it, you know, before they were going to invest. And then similarly, um, so I know that we do build a lot of relationships with founders early, but inevitably, you know, I think we get something like 5,000 inbounds a year. Um, so, we're, you know, if something's really compelling, we're going to like jump at it. So it's a bit of a combination, I think, for North Star. Awesome. Right. Yeah. There's also more variables, but I'm not going to expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but lovely. So I think we've been talking about positioning and deal flow strategy. I think there's a lot of shifts as well in the investment strategy, and uh, also deciding in which stages uh, do you guys want to be present or you want to be relevant. Uh, we see, of course, uh, uh, some of the early stage funds considering to raise growth funds or the growth funds being early on. Let's take the growth uh, stage, uh, or let's take the question that Kilian you you brought me yesterday. I think was very interesting interesting, which is, should early sta stage funds consider raising larger funds, growth funds? What are the pros and cons? Mm. Um, yeah. What is your take on yeah. that one? <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think, yeah, like a lot of funds um, at Northstone were thinking about this, like whether you know to go earlier, to go later. We are going earlier today, so we do some seed investments today um, out of our main sort of 450 million fund. Um, and then I think the way we're starting to think about the larger funds is because the European companies are growing so much quicker, whereas before, you know, they needed whatever, 10 million, 15 million for the first few years after they kind of you know, get that product market fit. Now, because they can grow so much faster, they need more capital quicker. Hmm. And so even though you're sort of investing more money, it's actually still quite an early stage of, of the business's life. And so, you know, I think the, we, the way we're thinking about it is we, we might sort of, you know, think about going up, um, raising a bigger fund sort of because of, you know, to, to sort of match the expectations of what's happening with the, with the companies. All right. And you also um, raise a good question is how do you actually argue larger funds to your existing LPs? Uh, but I think I want to ask, give that question to uh, our growth funds here. So, uh, Mika, how can uh, how can you argue for larger funds? So our growth fund is not an opportunity fund for the early fund. Hmm. That's one thing. So it's it's very much a separate fund. Partly what you just said. There are so many more companies growing faster, hitting growth stage. There's a lot of opportunities just to invest. Um, in a B, C, D round uh, that maybe we didn't invest earlier. So in our, in our early fund, we have reserves. And so we, once we invest there, we, try, we keep everyone in that fund and then we'll invest separately in a growth round. Um, and so, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> so, how can we argue? Uh, so, you have oh, a growth fund. Yeah, so, so, what is the arguments for LPs uh, on this sense? Yeah. The, I think the argument is also similar to what, what uh, Killian said is that we actually see a lot of opportunities for growth as kind of early growth. So those, those growth can be a 500 million valuation, 1 billion, 5 billion, but we see a lot around the 500 million valuation, which means you can potentially still have a 10X return. So from an LP, you can say, this is a growth vehicle because the, the, the company obviously has product market fit. They have, uh, they have real revenue. They, they're much more predictable revenue. They are less risky in many ways, but yet they're still growing very fast and there's still, there's still actually a, a pretty good return potential from these. Uh, the challenge in some of these companies is that growth rounds now, uh, five years ago they were 20 to 50 million, now they're 50 to 200 million, so you need a lot more capital to participate sure. in those growth rounds, even at a 500 million valuation. So that's the other argument, we need more capital in our growth fund because uh, we, we, if we want to actually have a meaningful ownership of it, we need to have a, a, a lot more capital. So interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it's a very interesting topic. I mean, we, we discuss it a lot internally, I think. You know, the way we've seen it is that the, um, the, the actual addressable opportunity out there for, for the type of investments that, that we're looking at very much on, on the scale-up stage, you know, say your, your Series A to C is just expanding at a very fast pace in, in Europe. The, you know, there's the, the, a higher number of, of really high quality um, you know, startups that we want to invest in. So in a way, you know, with, with an increasing addressable opportunity, you can 
you you can almost stay true to your strategy and 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 you know just just ride the wave of of that and so we probably feel kind of less stressed about you know changing the strategy in 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 the context of of that i think you know with any fund you, you're always evaluating your strategy you're always thinking um you know looking at the market and seeing how, how it's evolving and how you can you can adjust that um and occasionally we, we will go early stage occasionally later yeah. stage as well it's often you know thematically driven or or, or a team that you know we're, we're very keen on backing but we think it's also a different skill set investing you know seed versus yeah. versus growth which um i think as a fund you, you kind of need to think of what your you know competitive advantage is and what, what your edge is in the market and and how does that you know reflect the opportunity and then also balance the the interest of the LPs. What, what, what does you, your LPs want you, you know, to invest in? What, what is the demand that you have, and, and how much flexibility is it there? And you also expressed uh, when we were talking together that uh, talk, uh, bringing these changes in investment strategies always received with excitement on the LPs, right? Uh, can you? How I do don't you, know how you, how you do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I would say it's always uh, received with interest. Look, I think. I mean, the way we're saying this, there's a lot of LPs who are keen to get more exposure to technology in Europe. Uh, I mean, the, the, there's, there's a hunt, hunt for, for yield and good investments in, in, in a low, um, you know, low interest, low yield environment in, in general. And, you know, I think there's this excitement to, you know, back um, funds that, you know, at least have a demonstrable track record and, and, uh, and others. And I think, um, you know, I'd say that general excitement is, is positive. And so, um, you know, for us, it's, it's so far very much be to kind of stay true to, to the strategy we're operating in. Mm-hmm. Also on, on the strategy, uh, what we what I'm seeing a lot in Norway and in the Nordics is that uh, as funds get larger, as they're focusing on more sector based, they are forced to open up their geography mandate. So they're forced into Norwegian funds to enter into Sweden and enter into Denmark. So there, um, you all have a European presence, you all have several offices. So could you share with the audience some tips on how do you do that how you become relevant in new ecosystems what is your different strategies here um kilian you want to take this yes so north zone has offices in um london stockholm and new york um and we've been in new york since um uh sort of about five or six years ago. And the way we did that expansion was um, PJ, who's one of the senior partners um, at Northstone, he moved there. So he was physically based there for, um, for three years. So um, that's obviously one way to do it. He then sort of you know, got to know the ecosystem there. And we now have um, Wendy, um, who's a partner there and has a couple in her team um, in New York. Um, so that's the way we did it. We just had one of the team physically go and move there. Um, uh, but again, you know, ideally, if you, if you can if you sort of hire someone local, that's another another way to do it. But we sort of want to sort of it's it's difficult to to, to know in, in a market right without having any presence who is the right person, right? In much the same way, when you're investing, you know, sort of need to spend some time getting to the marketing. To the same, same thing, when you're sort of thinking about joining uh, hiring a, a, someone to join the team. Hmm. Uh, what is the advice on like stars? Uh, we have two ways we do it. One is that we work with local seed investors across Europe. Hmm. Uh, so we we don't uh, if we partner with them uh, we end up being second or third in the cap table we don't want to overrun the, the deal and so they like us as a partner because they can bring in a big international VC as kind of support the, the local seed investor so we use them on a deal by deal but also we look at the whole portfolio they send us like oh we have a company now going to be a Series A you should look at it so we I have at least personally over 20 kind of quarterly update calls with seed investors all over <laughs> Europe and they tell me what their portfolio is and we, we exchange notes and so this is a fantastic because they're a filter already for local market True. Uh, the other is that we're sector focused and so we you know if our partner is fintech uh, uh, focused Nicholas Brand he he just really digs around and says okay what are the hottest fintech deals of series A I mean seed A B C across <laughs> Europe and then he'll find a connection to them via a seed investor or another VC that we know so so it, it's, this is it's two ways we kind of try to uh, cover the market because it, it, there's a lot. I mean, you mentioned 5,000 inbound. It's like, it's, it's amazing <laughs> the, the volume we get, we all get. Uh, and the question is, how do you filter it? And so you have to have some some filter you have to use. So interesting. How do you guys do it? Yeah, I I would say si- similar to what Mick and Kellen out, outlined. I, I would say given that we're, we're more focused on the scale up stage, um, brings a little bit of benefits from kind of a geographical point of view. Uh, Companies we invest in tends to, 
uh, you know, have more visibility uh, or already be a little bit easier to find. Um, we take very much a partnership approach. We try to, you know, develop strong connections with the local ecosystem, the local investors. Um, but look, uh, covering covering Europe is, is, is quite hard because I think, as, as Mika said earlier, like, good, good founders are, are everywhere in Europe and, and can confront every country. Just, just the Nordics have... I don't know how many you know startup hubs and and being able to cover all of that is is tricky. It requires you know traveling, you're spending time in the ecosystem, you you building that. So um, it's um, it, it it takes time and effort. <laughs> Definitely not an easy job, but uh, so exciting to do. <laughs> yes. uh, we're soon running out of time, so I really need to raise the topic that we're all very excited about, or maybe very very worried about, which is the high valuations uh, in the <laughs> European market. So, of course, with more funds coming in, uh, lots of money available right now, valuations are going higher. So I just want to get a bit of sense of how do you feel about that, and do you think is it justified? Martin, take it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, uh, it's 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 a tough one. I mean, if if I knew for sure where valuations were going to go, if it's sustainable or, or not, I'd you know I'd, I'd probably be a rich man soon. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're you're kind of taking all the factors in and, and see what's justified. I mean, what what we're seeing is that we're just seeing that the opportunity set is you know a lot more attractive than historically in, in Europe by. I don't think I've been in the, in the industry as long as, as Killian and, and, and Mika, but you know, when I started, when I first kind of entered, entered tech eight years ago, I mean, it would just be unrecognizable mm. compared to what we're seeing today, just you know, quality of companies, the size of exit outcomes. And I mean, the way we think about valuation is that it's very much an output, not, not an input. You know, we, we make an assessment of you know, how, do, how big do we think this opportunity you know, can be and what's mm. the likeliness of it. And, you know, it would be a function of, you know, the team, the product, and, and the market, and, um, you know, with with, with the continued, um, you know, large outcomes and, and the quality that, that we're seeing, um, you know, we're also willing to pay a higher price to uh, to get into that. Mm. Um, but if it's sustainable for the future, I mean, it, 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 with, with high valuations come high expectations as well on founders. So, you know, it, it's probably never been a better opportunity to be a great founder and be out fundraising. But, you know, if you, if you raise that very high valuation, it also comes with very high expectations, um, you know, even, even greater outcomes, you know, scale even quicker. So, um, yeah, if you, if you can't deliver the growth rates, if you can't, you know, eventually kind of be on a sustainable path to profit one day, it, 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 it can be quite tough. Mm. You're definitely touching some of the cons of uh, higher valuations for founders in this case. Um, Kilian, uh, what is uh, your take on the market valuations now and uh, the pros and cons of it? Yeah, I, I think we were talking about it yesterday. I think, you know, what is the valuation meant to rep represent? It's some kind of present value of the future cash flows. And so the question then is, okay, well, are we potentially getting those cash f cash flows quicker? And so, you know, as I said, we had an LP meeting yesterday, obviously running through some of the stars of the portfolio. And one of these, one of our businesses now is a hundred million ARR in nine months. Wow, <laughs> it's just extraordinary, right? You, you just wouldn't have that five years ago. You know, it's just impossible. And we were just talking about the growth rates in the in the portfolio today. You know, before 100% growth rate was really good, and now you're seeing 200, 300, 400 percent. And so, as a result. If the valuation is meant to be some link between the present value of the future cash flows, if you're getting more of those cash flows quicker, then you have higher valuations. Plus, obviously, there's a you know, strong element of competition, but you know it's sort of inevitable. Mm. Mika? Well, if you look at the data, the, the European market is still um, lower valuations than the U.S. market, so there's still an arbitrage here. <laughs> so, uh, and the fact is that you know the U.S. They, they've been complaining about valuations for 20 years, and and they continue to do well. <laughs> uh, some people still seem to make money over there, and so uh, I, I look at that and I think that it's, it's the the trend line is just that. Companies, you know, the big winners are big winners, and they're now big global winners. Often, they they actually have a much even bigger scale. So, um, if you pick well, and you know, when we underwrite something, we we really debate: is this going to be, 
you know, what is the potential for the exit here? And if we don't believe it's going to be big enough, it might be a fantastically good business, but we, we're venture v investors, we look for the big winners. And so that's, that often determines whether we end up investing or not, is that how much we believe, how can it be a 10 billion company or something? Mm. Yeah. Well, let's continue on exits because as we said, uh, the evaluations can be justified or anchored to expected uh, exit evaluation. Uh, Mika, what is your sense of the exit environment in, in Europe? Is it positive, negative, how do you feel? I think it's quite positive. So the what's been missing is a bit the IPO market, but now you've seen like IDN went public in uh, in um, Amsterdam and Delivery Hero went public in uh, the UK, and so you people are actually using the local markets finally. Mm -hmm. I think that's been missing. Um, you know, even a gaming company Huge Games went public in Poland, and you see. So I think the fact that there are companies going public in the European markets, I think, is a very strong trend. Mm -hmm. um, there has also been plenty of m and I think what's been missing a little bit is some of the big European corporates haven't been as active as, as, as I think they might I think they would be, but I, I, I'm actually, you know, it's, and this, the uh, exit market is what fuels the whole thing. If there's no exits, there's no capital coming back to us or the founders, and that's this, 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 done. this, 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 this <laughs> is it. So that's, that's part of the, that's the flywheel that has to happen. So I, I, it's, it's good. Yeah. Uh, Kilian, what do you think of the exit environments and uh, exit risks, maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, as I said, I think that the environment overall is becoming much healthier. Um, didn't sort of see, you know, it's this, the SPACs thing is quite interesting. <laughs> you know, again, we had an investment bank present um, to us yesterday, and it's interesting, so SPAC origination volume is down like 90% um, since March, so it's just sort of really sort of fallen off a cliff. Yeah. So that couldn't be dead now, <laughs> um, <laughs> sadly for founders and <laughs> VCs. <laughs> um, uh, so, but so, yeah, but it, I think it's, it's interesting to show just that there's, you know, constant sort of innovation around the space, right? That, you know, how else can sort of monetize these things? And, and another question is, you you know, is, are, there's, are there going to be more of these later stage funds where there's more opportunities to do more secondaries, mm. um, you know, without having sort of big, big full, full exits? Um, so, yeah, I think there's lots of interesting stuff happening in the exits. Mm -hmm. I think we will see many more new vehicles happening uh, yeah. as a way of solving this problem. Yeah. Do you want to complement uh, on this topic? Yeah, I was thinking if, if have any other perspectives to, to kind of bring, I think we, we also have a positive view of the exit environment in, in Europe where, you know, seeing more activity than, than ever before. Um, both on, on kind of strategic uh, exits as well as, as IPOs, I think. You know, the public markets, there's, there's, there's a general, um, you, you, you know, strive to get more exposure to technology companies, both from institutional investors and retail investors. And I think, you know, that, that lays the foundation for, for a healthy, um, you know, pu public market exit. I think, um, I think COVID has played a, a degree as well, just in the kind of the broader tech adoption and many incumbents waking up to, you know, that they, um, they need, um, you know, a revamped technology strategy and presents good uh, takeout opportunities for at least companies with a strong product or, or, or IP around that. So no, in general, back to kind of the point that, that was mentioned earlier, we, we wouldn't, um, we, uh, investors wouldn't be willing to, to pay the higher entry uh, valuations if they didn't think it was value at exit, and, and that comes from, from the exit outcome. So um, it's, it's all interlinked. Mm. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, we have five minutes left, and I think I want to use this uh, minutes to talk uh, the last topic that I think um, it's been an important topic in the last two years uh, in the VC industry, and uh, it's definitely going to shape uh, the next decade of investment uh, ecosystem, uh, which is the topic of sustainability and ESG. Uh, the fact that there is a need for more demands of sustainable finance, and uh, there is some new more regulation coming in the EU taxonomy and how we're going to measure all this. Um, how are you guys uh, addressing this topic and how are you positioning yourselves towards very focused funds on climate uh, and sustainability? Martin, you start this time. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, no, we, we, think it, we think it's a super important topic. I think, I think as, as a fund, there's, there's only so much you can do with your strategy. I think what we've been doing for you know, the past um, 20 years that we've been operating in, in, in Europe is, you know, remains uh, uh, the same. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of opportunities arising from, uh, from the topics, you, you know, in, in, we're super excited from a thematic point of view about certain sectors that kind of plays to, you know, the ESG and the, the kind of new sustainability themes in energy, for example, we recently did our first investment in, in Norway, 
a consumer energy company called Tibber, which is trying oh. to, uh, you, you know, help help uh, consumers uh, engage better with their uh, electricity and and you know make better electricity usage. This. Uh, you know, a wide range of benefits that we see from improving the diversity level, especially on the management and, and leadership layer across our portfolio. But I think for us, it's often to achieve better business outcomes, um, not necessarily having specific targets, but, you know, just for, for the improvement of, of performance of, of our portfolio companies. Hmm, definitely. Mika, what is your take? Uh, it's interesting because uh, we as a partnership are very excited about it. We, we've started now, uh, because we have to by the EU rules, we're tracking all of our companies with their various metrics in the ESG, when we're also tracking ourselves. Um, and like this morning I had a meeting with a potential LP that we've talked to for a while and they had a strong interest in investing in us if we had a climate fund. Of course. And so we, I get that a lot, but the, the challenge for us, if we are true to ourselves and being sector focused, we want to be experts in it or at least have expertise in it. Yes. We want to have a portfolio in it. So we've done now a few small investments uh, just to kind of get our feet wet. And if we would do one, and I'm not saying we are because we're still looking at it, is we need to hire really expert expert people and also decide climate is, a, ESG is a very broad, in, in climate tech itself is very broad. So, much. so you have to decide what do you want to do and, and we want to do it well. So uh, I think it's, it's definitely uh, we're seeing the uh, uh, opportunities and we're, we're considering it. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Chris Saka has to say later today. <laughs> you know, he's got an 800 million uh, you know, climate fund now. Wow. Uh, so uh, his, uh, it's called Lower Car Carbon Capital. You know, his previous fund is Lower Case Capital. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what he says because uh, he has said very bluntly, he said, I'm doing this and I want competition. Everyone should start a climate <laughs> fund. Uh, I thought that was really cool. And so I, uh, I think that uh, I personally would love for us to do more. But again, we need to, you know, we are a institutional professional fund. So we need to take it very seriously if we'll do it. Correct. Correct. Mm. Um, Alien. Yeah. And very quickly, I think North Zone, I think if I think two things to think about what is North Zone sort of doing internally and then in terms of actually um, on the investing side. So um, one thing I was very impressed with when I was interviewing with the firm is both in the partnership and in the on, in the team is um, sort of it's sort of fifty percent sort of male and female, and then you know half of the team you know there's a decent portion of the team come from like diverse backgrounds as well. So I think the the North Zone partnership early on said we don't want to be we want to address this early on, so that's quite good. And then on the portfolio side, I think um, you know PJ one of, the, one of the partners has talked a little bit about how more of the companies that we invest in now, the entrepreneurs have a strong element of ESG to what they're doing. So before, you know, more founders were there to solve business problems. Increasingly, what we're seeing is founders who are here to solve a, a world's problem. They're not just about sort of solving a business problem. True. And um, we're seeing that in the portfolio as well. That's one of the things, a lot of things that we're sort of seeing, you're starting to invest in. Right. True. All right, guys, we have run out of time. I want to thank my fantastic panelists for a great discussion. I want to thank you all for sh uh, showing up and being part of this. And uh, I wish you a fantastic tech barbecue. And uh, let's leave this room feeling that the VC ecosystem is more exciting than ever, being ABC <laughs> is more exciting than ever. And we're going to go out there and uh, outbeat the Americans <laughs> coming to us. <laughs> thank you so much. Cheers. 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 Cheers.